Welcome to part four of our series, Sorry, Learning How to Forgive and Seek Forgiveness. Over the last few weeks, we've taken a look at why forgiveness matters, what to do when you need to say you're sorry, and what are the steps to take beyond I'm sorry. I'm hopeful you've paid careful attention to each part, and the information provided has helped and challenged you to either offer forgiveness to someone or seek forgiveness from someone. Now, if you're just joining us for the series, please go to our YouTube channel and check out parts one, two, and three. And while you're there, subscribe to the channel and turn the bell on so you don't miss any of our messages or any of the other content we offer to you. Today, we wrap up the series, and here's how I want to do so. Virtually everything I've shared with you so far in this series assumes there are clearly defined boundaries that have been crossed. Either someone has crossed a boundary of yours, or you have crossed a boundary of someone else. In other words, someone did something to someone, someone's violated, someone needs to apologize, someone needs to forgive. But you know as well as I do that life isn't always so clean. Often, especially in intimate relationships, there are several boundaries crossed by both parties. Some boundaries are muddy, and some of us aren't even sure when they were first crossed. What does that mean? It means both people involved need to apologize to the other, but neither person is fully sorry and neither is fully willing to forgive the other. This is what most strained relationships look like. I wish every relationship with problems were fixed with a simple, sincere, and truthful apology. But we know relationships and apologies and pain are not as simple, especially when it involves intimate relationships like marriage. Over the last 30 years of marriage, I crossed many boundaries Lana established. I broke her trust. I've been sarcastic. I've been selfish. I've been angry. I've been stubborn. And in most of those situations, I've sincerely apologized and we've worked our way through them. But there have been more complicated situations when a simple apology fell short. There have been times when I was rude with Lana or sarcastic or selfish, but I've also felt she was misunderstanding me or being difficult or not seeing my heart or intentions, but rather judging my actions only when she ought to know better based on 30 years of marriage. In other words, sometimes there are plenty of apologies to go around. Sometimes the apology is only the beginning of a long, detailed, complex relation situation. Occasionally, the relationship existing between two or more people is a mess, and saying I'm sorry won't fix it. What then? In other words, what do you do when, instead of there being one string that reads I'm sorry and one string that reads I forgive you, you have a huge ball of tangled string and you're not sure where to even begin pulling? Before I provide you with a few thoughts to help guide you through, let's look at two passages of Scripture. Matthew 5, 23, 24. If you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go. First make things right with your brother or sister and then come back and offer your gift. Jesus calls us to make it right with people, the person we've hurt or wounded. So much so we are to quit singing, quit praying, quit listening to sermons until we make it right. According to Jesus, apologizing is high on the priority list, so go get it done. Romans 12, 18. If possible, to the best of your ability, live at peace with all people. What do these two passages tell us? We are to do whatever we have to do. Leave church, quit singing in the choir, quit posting on Facebook, go out of our way, do whatever we possibly can do within reason to live with people in peace. Before we go any further, how are you doing with that? Do you have any relationships you need to make right? Is there anybody you need to say, I'm sorry, or anybody you need to give forgiveness to? If there's anyone with whom you are experiencing a thorny situation, go right now and make it right. Okay, let me give you five huge thoughts to help you navigate through this maze, unravel this ball of yarn. Number one, be ruthlessly honest. The reason I qualify honest with ruthlessly is because we are not often honest with ourselves. We think we are, but we are consistently short of the truth. That's natural. We are incapable of objectively judging ourselves. We justify, rationalize, excuse, and explain away what's real about ourselves. We're just not honest. And one of the best ways you can get to the truth is to become completely quiet and listen. Listen, listen, listen. Why? Because we don't listen. We talk too much. We talk because we think we already know, but we don't. Anthony DeMello writes, the most difficult thing in the world is to listen, to see. We don't want to see. Do you think a capitalist wants to see what's good in the communist system? Do you think a communist wants to see what's good and healthy in the capitalist system? Do you think a rich man wants to look at poor people? 
We don't want to look because if we do, we may change. We don't want to look. If you look, you lose control of the life that you are so precariously holding together. And so in order to wake up, the one thing you need most is not energy or strength or youthfulness or even great intelligence. The one thing you need most of all is the readiness to learn something new. The chances that you will wake up are in direct proportion to the amount of truth you can take without running away. Wow. We don't listen. We run away too quickly. So as painful as this is, do this. Ask the person with whom you're having a relational strain to tell you the problem, their perception of the problem, how they see it, and then be quiet and listen. Number two. Admit changes need to be made on both sides. If you know you've messed up a relationship, you've been selfish or a jerk, this should encourage you a little. The chances are very high that you are not all to blame. I've never counseled a couple or a group of friends where the blame was clearly laid on one person. In every strained relationship, there is enough blame to go around. So yes, own what you did wrong, but do not own more than you did wrong. Walk through the repair and rebuild the stages that you need to rebuild slowly. You have blame, they have blame. Don't get too discouraged. There's plenty of air to go around to everybody. Number three, fake it until you make it. I know that might sound unusual that I would say that, but this has to do with feelings. Forget your feelings. Listen very carefully. If your husband or wife or significant other reveals to you that you need to make him or her feel loved, valued, chosen, then you need to figure out how to do those things. Are you necessarily going to feel like doing them? No, but it doesn't matter. Do them anyway. If the relationship matters to you, do whatever you must do. Fake it till you make it. Because whether your husband or wife feels loved or valued matters more than whether or not you feel like giving it to them. Here's what I've learned. Most often, feelings follow actions. Your emotions will respond to the actions you take. Here's a great exercise, okay, to get you started. Ask yourself this question, and be honest when you answer it. What would I do or say, or how would I act if I felt like doing or saying or acting. Then do, say, or act that way. You will often act your way into feeling, but you will rarely feel your way into acting. Number four, realize forgiveness and confession are disciplines. This is the most challenging of the five. Why? Because it is about doing what's right, what we're called to do, What is the most Christ-like action to take? And it doesn't have anything to do with who is right or wrong. Is it fair? It doesn't have anything to do with us or the other person. We forgive and we confess because we are called to do it. These are decisions we make and each is a discipline we engage. Just like the decision to get up early and exercise or to give a percentage of your income to charity. Once the decision is made, you manage the tension it brings. Now, here's the good part. Uh, You no longer have to try and feel inspired to do what you know you need to do. Inspiration has nothing to do with it. You've already made the decision. Now do it. Confess when you're wrong and forgive when you are wronged. Number five, very important. It takes practice. Remember, everything we've talked about in this series is a long, curvy, tedious, nuanced journey. Sometimes you will get it right the first time. Most times you won't. Learn from each time and improve. Start small. What do I mean? I mean, begin with keeping all accounts short. If you err in the smallest area, admit it and ask for forgiveness. If someone apologizes to you, give forgiveness quickly and freely. Do it again and again, and again. You will get better. You will get more sincere. You will get more compassionate. You will develop a habit of apologizing, and you will not allow relationships to remain fractured long. You will, over time, become a model for saying you're sorry and for accepting the apologies of other people. All right, here's what I want to do. I want to quickly review, and then we're going to pray. Number one, be ruthlessly honest. Do not let yourself off the hook. 
Number two, admit changes need to be made on both sides. Own what's yours, but don't own what's not yours. Number three, fake it till you make it. Forget feelings. Follow actions. The feeling will eventually come. Number four, realize forgiveness and confession are disciplines. Do what's right, no matter how you feel about it, no matter what. And number five, it takes practice. Do it over and over and over again. I want to pray with you as we close out this part four and also this entire series. So if you're sitting there with your husband or wife, maybe join hands or maybe someone you're dating, join hands, or maybe your family's there and you can just gather around. I want to pray not only for you, but I want to pray with you and pray that God will take the truths of all the stuff we've covered over the last four weeks and just set it on fire inside of us. Join with me, please. Father, as we wrap up this series, we do so hopeful and prayerful that you will take the truth that we have discussed over these last few weeks and just literally set it on fire inside of us, burning out the lies, burning out the excuses, burning out the reasons we give for allowing our marriages to stay fractured, allowing our friendships to fall apart. Father, give us the courage we need to go and ask for forgiveness from people and also to grant forgiveness when other people apologize to us. Father, if there's ever a time in our country where we need to radically give forgiveness, it is now. And if there's ever been a time where we need to humble ourselves and genuinely ask for forgiveness, it is now. Father, I pray you bring all of us to our knees, our knees in humility, and may we just find people we've hurt and make it right with them. And when others come to us, no matter what they've done to us, may we see them through the eyes of your son Jesus and love them as you have loved us and give forgiveness to them as you have poured forgiveness upon us. Thank you for what we've covered over these last few weeks. And we are excited about what you're gonna do as a result of this truth that has been dropped into us. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus, amen. Thanks for watching this video. While you're here, make sure you subscribe and turn the bell on so you don't miss any other videos or content Forest Park releases. Make sure you share this with a friend. Take a few moments and check out some other things Forest Park has.